So welcome all. My name is Walt Hill. I'm the executive director at High Plains Mental Health Center here in Hayes. And we have a lot of more important people here. Just to um, give you kind of background, two years ago we uh, did an event called Hope in the Heartland to highlight the issues of agriculture, agribusiness, and mental health in our region. Uh, we have seen um, many changes, many challenges, uh, tragedies, unfortunately. We talked over lunch about some of the very unfortunate things that happened to save family farms. Um, the, this event really was brought up by our partners at uh, various federal agencies particularly by Kim Nelson, who is the Regional Director of SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and uh, we called us and said that the Secretary of HHS was interested in researching more uh, and hearing on to a tour or having a staff tour and hear about various mental health event issues across the country. So we began working with our federal partners uh, that included uh, uh, RISA, uh, SAMHSA, HHS. I don't know where uh, Joseph is. Is he? He's around here somewhere. Okay. Hi, Joseph. You can come up here if you want. Because <laughs> I'm going to introduce you whether you do or not. <laughs> People who know me know I have no hesitancy to embarrass people. But uh, this is Joseph Palm. Joseph is the Regional Director, HHS, Health and Human Services, Intergovernmental and External Affairs. Um, Kim is Regional Administrator of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Nancy Rios is here. She's from Harissa, Health Resources Services Administration. Uh, Nick Klaus is here uh, with uh, HHS Intergovernmental External. I thought we had a lot of summaries in our titles. You guys are great. Uh, Christy Davis. Hi, Christy. Thanks. Christy's here from Kansas State, Director of uh, or from Kansas State U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development, um, the state director. So. We have uh, quite an impressive list of folks here to, to hear on this listening tour about what people here in Northwest Kansas, Middle America have to say about the intersection of mental health and agribusiness. I want to stress agribusiness because what we know whom we're, what we know is this just doesn't affect the producer. It affects the veterinarian, uh, affects the gas station, uh, the co-op operator, uh, kids, teacher. It affects our whole community because agriculture is such a major piece of the economy, the backbone here, and frankly, I believe a huge portion of the backbone of our country. If you go without a meal for five weeks, you'll probably appreciate that. So, um, so this is a national tour. Our uh, structure of this is we have a great panel. We'll have them introduce themselves. And they'll talk about uh, their perspectives and they'll tell you what, what they do within agribusiness or mental health or education or veterinarian or, or healthcare. Um, their perspective on issues, stresses, challenges in agriculture and mental health in our region. And at the end of that, we're going to uh, give an opportunity for our tour guests from um, HHS, Harissa, uh, Rural Development to ask any questions of them. And then if we have enough time, questions um, that you in the audience might have, but the, the smaller audience is our federal partners who ask us to put on this kind of listening tour. 
So um, uh, we do want to provide um, some context for what our panelists will speak about. And we have three guests here um, to give you some overview of issues around mental health, behavioral health, agriculture, health in general. And the first uh, to present, as i so glad to, oh, I forgot one person, is Ken Rogers in the room? No. No? He left? Okay. <laughs> Good. We can talk about him. Uh, <laughs> I want to uh, uh, acknowledge Ken Rod, Representative Ken Rogers, uh, who uh, serves part of our area. Uh, up north. Ken has been a great supporter of uh, mental health. He's very involved in the agriculture sector and his broadcast and, um, operations and uh, has his thumb on the pulse of issues in ag. And uh, so, Ken, I want to thank you so much for coming. And, uh, um, he did such a good job at the first event as the MC. I thought if, uh, that. I wouldn't even try to do better. <laughs> okay, so Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Andrew Brown is the Commissioner of Behavioral Health for the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services from Topeka, and he's gonna give some introductory context remarks. Thank you all. Um, so I wanted to start off by saying, you know, uh, when, I, when I got this invitation originally from SAMHSA, it was like, you know, come and talk for five minutes and uh, talk a little bit about suicide prevention in Kansas and what you guys are doing. And, um, of course, when I arrived here, I immediately saw that there was already a ton of information out in the lobby about suicide prevention. So if you haven't had a chance to pick this up, this is Hope in the Heartland. It's a High Plains uh, brochure on suicide prevention and our farmers. And um, it has a lot of good information in here about what our current statistics look like in Kansas, as well as different types of uh, stress factors and warning signs. Um, and back of the bit is how to get help at High Plains, right? So if you're in this section of the state, uh, that's a great resource. Another thing that um, is a great resource is the uh, to-go kits that were developed last year. Uh, in co collaboration uh, between several of the um, mental health TTCs uh, from Region 7, 8, and, seven and, eight. Yeah, seven and eight. 7 and 8. I think there's a third one, but I, Rocky Mountain maybe? That's, that's, eight. that's 8. Okay. So, um, but we worked together to develop these to-go kits um, to respond not only to um, rural stress situations, but also sort of disaster stress uh, issues that might occur in rural communities. Uh, so there's you know, information in there about um, how to respond to droughts, uh, which if you're aware of what's going on right now, we're in the midst of probably one of the biggest one of those we've ever dealt with. Um, there's a lot of uh, good information in those, a lot of things that can be printed out, handed out, passed out, used in social media, those kinds of things. Um, and it's a great, great resource for um, those of us that are on the ground here in Kansas. Um, we also have had, uh, within our state, a lot of really great things happening in the last couple of years around mental health in general. Uh, one of the first ones is um, the passage of a legislation last year that enacted um, guidance for KDEDs to establish certified community behavioral health clinics across the state. And um, for those of you that were paying attention, High Plains is going to be um, one of our new CCBHCs this year. So we're excited to get them online and um, set up with that new, um, new perspective. So just this week, yesterday, we found out that CMS approved our state plan amendment. Um, so we are ready to roll and um, we're going to be working with High Plains here in Hayes to serve this corner of the state and make sure that you guys have access to all those services that are offered by CCBHCs. Um, we also uh, passed legislation this year for 988. 
the, that legislation will fund um, this three digit number uh, and make sure that those calls are answered here in Kansas. So if you are someone who's struggling with um, really kind of any kind of behavioral health issue at all, um, but if it's a crisis situation or you know a situation where suicide might be a factor, um, 980 is a number that you can call to get connected immediately to somebody that can help. Um, and then uh, we'll also be building additional crisis stabilization units around the state and um, mobile crisis services around the state. So those are things that are yet to come, but 988 went into effect on the 16th of this month. Um, so it's been rolling for a little over a week or so. And um, we're excited because here in Kansas, we seem to be answering that at about 90% of the calls that come from in-state or being answered in-state. So we're excited about that. Um, we also, uh, last year, started our statewide suicide prevention coalition. Uh, so we've been working with um, a number of uh, stakeholders and preventionists around the state on um, how to support building state infrastructure for suicide prevention. Um, it may have already been pointed out once today, but Kansas um, has a very high rate of suicide to begin with. Uh, in our rural and frontier areas, it's even higher. Uh, the rate of growth is very significant. It's almost 45% over the last 10 years. Um, we're seeing those kinds of numbers um, in part because of the way um, stress is impacting our communities, um, but also uh, in the way that our state has uh, maybe not always put that forward as being a priority. And so this year, in the governor's budget, she included uh, $1.5 million for uh, um, suicide prevention and post-prevention efforts. Um, so we're working right now on getting contracts in place to support that. And we're anticipating that we'll start developing some statewide campaigns and things to go with it, along with 988. And then the last thing that I wanted to say is just that when you look at the states around us, right, um, you know, we're kind of in line, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, we all have kind of high rates. One of the exceptions to that in our area is Nebraska. Nebraska's rates are lower. And so we're trying to pay at the state level some attention to what Nebraska's doing to see if there's things that they might be doing that we're not, that we could be. Um, and we're hoping that um, we might be able to learn something from what they're doing. But this is a field where we've been investing a lot of um, effort over the last several years. We've been working very closely with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center at the national level um, and with um, our own state resource center um, to really kind of identify a new state prevention plan. Um, so that was released last year. It goes through 2021 through 2025. And um, we'll be reviewing that and updating it every year. So just some things that we're doing, and I will pass the baton. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, we have a representative from the um, Kansas uh, Department of Health and Environment, uh, Diana. Dana Zolk. Zolk? Dana? Uh, she knows her name. Hi everyone, again, my name is Dana Zolk. I'm the Section Director for Injury and Violence Prevention Programs at the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And I have the um, great respect for this community of bringing together partners regularly to look at the barriers and facilitators around mental health and specifically suicide prevention. Um, I was grateful to be able to come out a couple of years ago to your Kevin Hines event, and so many thanks. Um, I wanted to share with you that the Kansas Department of Health and Environment's primary role in suicide prevention is related to data. We look at data from vital statistics, the Kansas Hospital Association, including hospital discharge and emergency department visits, and a special system called Essence, which is near real-time emergency department data. 
We also have what's known as sort of the gold standard, the Kansas Violent Death Reporting System, which collects information on violent deaths from death certificates, law enforcement reports, and coroner and medical examiner reports. And we use that data to pull circumstances so maybe we can get smarter about prevention efforts. We also capitalize on our partners' data and look at things like the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and Kansas Communities That Care. And I'm sure that you've all had a lot of data points thrown at you today, um, but I'm going to throw some more, uh, but know in my heart that I firmly believe one is too many. So you've already heard that our overall suicide rate in Kansas is higher than the national rate. Our rate of suicide in Kansas increased 65% between 2001 and 2020. Suicide's the ninth leading cause of death among all ages in Kansas, and second leading cause of death for those 10 to 34. In 2020 alone, Kansas resident suicides cost an estimated $5.7 billion in medical expenses and work loss. And additionally, there were 8,100 excuse me, 81,467 years of potential life lost before age 75 due to suicide from 2015 to 2019 in Kansas. There are some significant differences um, when you break the data down. As far as sex goes, between 2015 and 2019, about 78.5 percent of suicide victims in Kansas were males, which was about three times the corresponding rate for females. White non-Hispanic persons had the highest suicide rate at 22.4 per 100,000. Black non-Hispanic and Hispanics had similar suicide rates of 12 per 100,000. Those ages 35 to 44 had the highest suicide mortality rate. Our veterans had a 3.5 times higher suicide rate than non-veterans. When you look at population density, over the past 20 years, all Kansas counties have increased suicide rates. Suicides in, in frontier and rural counties, though, outpaced those in densely settled rural, semi-urban, and urban counties. Frontier counties had a suicide rate of 33.1 per 100,000, which is 58% higher than the state rate. If you look at occupation, there's also some differences. When our VDRS data is broken down, um, our 2015 to 2018 data shows a, the highest male suicide rate with farming, fishing, and forestry. And that rate is 159.1 per 100,000. So six, seven times higher than the, the um, state rate. And among female workers, those in healthcare support had the highest state rate at 23.1 per 100,000. And if you look at rates nationally for occupations, these are significantly higher than the national rates for the three Fs as well as healthcare support. Of course, deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. So we also look at, like I said, emergency department and hospital discharges. Between 2016 and 2020, emergency department visits for suicidal ideations increased 25% in our state. In 2020, about 122 point per 100,000 Kansans visited the emergency department due to intentional self-harm, and an additional 14 per 100,000 Kansans for suicide attempts. Youth, particularly those aged 15 to 19 years, had the absolute highest emergency department visit rate for all suicide-related diagnoses. So that's a, some pretty sobering facts, and again, I'm sure you've heard them throughout the day. Um, so what are we doing about it? Well, I'd like to say at this point in time that we're growing stronger in our state. We are working very hard on collaborating, working smarter and stronger together. Um, specifically at KDHE, we do have some programming. Um, one of our most recent funding opportunities came from SAMHSA with the implementation of zero suicide in health systems. And that is a framework to improve suicide care for those within health and behavioral health systems. Most people have had contact within those systems prior to their attempt. 
Through that funding, we are currently contract with, contracted with five CMHCs to implement zero suicide. We're working with a large health system who's also implementing, though challenged through COVID, and um, seeking community-wide initiatives through work with a couple primary care clinics. We've also contracted with the Kansas PHQ, Kansas Suicide Prevention Headquarters, I'll, I'll say that out for everyone, the Educational Development Center and um, for CAMS Care, which is a specialized training for clinicians. One of the other things that our zero suicide epidemiologist is doing is providing a data alert on a monthly basis to the community mental health centers and local health departments where the essence data is indicating um, at least or more than a two standard deviation from their previous few months of data. And I'm happy to say that these data alerts are spurring conversations within communities. One of the things that we learned during year one of zero suicide is as we were offering trainings, school personnel are ravenous for education on suicide prevention. We can't do that with zero suicide. So when we were writing our core state injury prevention program grant opportunity, um, we included some funding that focused on schools. Very minor amount, $12,000 dedicated to um, the suicide prevention headquarters, being able to dedicate some time to provide them with training and a review of their policies. I already mentioned core SIP. Um, there are other alignments for suicide prevention and mental health um, support through KDHE, including um, we worked with the Kansas Trauma Program. There are at least a couple regional trauma councils who are very interested in suicide prevention as um, a major issue within their regions, and that's six regions within the state. And we recently, through Zero Suicide, provided them uh, some targeted counseling on access to lethal means trainings which went really well, I'm pleased to share. Um, I'm in the Bureau of Health Promotion at KDHE, but we have partners in the Bureau of Family Health who are also working on prevention through things like perinatal screening for both maternal and depression, maternal and paternal depression. They have um, recently received a maternal anti-violence innovation and sharing project which means that they're working in conjunction with the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence and other partners, including law enforcement, to focus on reducing maternal deaths in Kansas due to homicide and suicide. The Bureau of Family Health also has a maternal mortality review committee, so they're reviewing maternal mortality cases, including uh, pregnancy-associated and pregnancy-related deaths, typically looking at pregnancy and one year postpartum to understand medical and social factors leading to these deaths. The Bureau of Family Health also has a pediatrics commitment um, called Kansas Kids Map, and they're providing case-based consultation with experts in pediatric mental health, and they've developed a pediatric mental health toolkit available on our website. And through their adolescent health program, they've included suicide prevention and substance abuse prevention in youth health guide and whole healthy you materials, which were developed with a youth focus group. And um, the last thing I wanna mention is that we continue to actively seek funding, especially when it comes to youth and agriculture. Everyone cross your fingers and your toes. We submitted a, a, an application to CDC a couple months back that we're hoping um, in September to learn that we are awarded, which would focus on frontier counties and those specific populations of youth and agriculture. We had um, ongoing conversations with the Department of Ag and K-State Research and Extension to come up with a plan for that. So um, I'll turn the mic back over to you. you. I'll be here for questions if anyone has any. Y'all are very busy. Thank you for all your work. So we have one other kind of contextual presenter um, and as Kelsey Olson, the Deputy Secretary of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I have to, I just want to say, when we, I had never heard of Kelsey Olson, okay, <laughs> until we had the huge four-county fire. 
It was just devastating. And we had other fires out here. And what I saw is she just rallied the troops to get folks together to respond to the communities. The governor came out. She did yeoman's, yo person's effort to, uh, to respond. So on behalf of these areas, thank you for uh, attending to our needs out here. Well, well, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, what you might not know about me is I'm actually from Northwest Kansas. So I will move mountains to make sure that we get the resources that um, we need out here in this part. So Norton, I'm proud Norton native. Oh. So, um, like Walt said, my name is Kelsey Olson. I'm with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Um, and it's been mentioned before, but agriculture is the state's largest economic driver for Kansas. Um, without agriculture, many of us wouldn't have jobs to support. Um, our communities wouldn't be where they are. Um, and it is it's something that I'm proud to be affiliated with and proud to be here. In 2019, when I assumed this position, um, it became apparent to me that we needed to have conversations around mental health and agriculture. I'd hear, I had heard Dana speak one time um, and, and knew we needed to do more on behalf of agriculture to destigmatize and have the conversation around mental health. So in 2019, I literally chased Andy Brown down the sidewalk one day. Um, I had put myself into a conference that I knew nothing about with mental health um, practitioners, but I wanted to know more, and I knew we could do more. So I attended, I chased Andy, I said, hey, I've got this idea, we're gonna do some cool things, um, and I need to be a partner. Um, and it's just really catapulted from there. So before I go any further, um, I believe there's a video that um, is going to be pulled up, and I wanna share this to provide a little bit of context. This is a... Um, My personal experience. It, it's a personal, personal story, so I'll just let Nick take it from here. My personal experience with stress in agriculture is my father took his life. Uh, it was a stressful, stressful life that he had, and he poured everything that he had into the farm, into our family, and it, it caught up to him. And I think he was in a place where he was, he felt alone, and he felt that he wasn't uh, providing for us the way, that, the way that we deserved, and we saw it differently. I'm Nick Hazenkamp. I am the second oldest of seven kids, grew up on a farm in South uh, Nemaha County. So my father was, was actually born on the farm. He was literally born and raised uh, and, and spent his entire life on this farm. We didn't really know that there was a problem. Um, we became aware of, of the issue. My brother found some, uh, the things would indicate that things were pretty serious. We really sought the help and, and the support and try to find the resources to help improve his mental condition. I like to say we, the reason it happened was because we didn't think it was going to happen. When my dad had passed, when he took his life, it, in a very short period of time, we had to determine, and really my mom had to determine how we keep this legacy moving forward. Ben was 19, Josh was 11, and mom was now a widow of seven kids. Me and my older brother, we were off in our jobs. You know, that wasn't the path that we were going down was to take over the farm. So they, my younger brothers, for now close to 12 years, have been carrying the torch and have been leading this farm and managing this farm to what it is today. I see depression, I see specifically suicide very, very differently now that it's impacted us. And I, I think there's there's that stigma of, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and let's move forward. And this is a population and a culture that they pride themselves on the hard work that they do. And when we have a problem that we can't outwork, we just kind of forget about it. What happens is, is we continue to, to bury our emotions, we continue to bury our problems and they don't get addressed. I would say if, if you're struggling with mental health or if you're struggling with suicidal thoughts specifically, my advice is to receive the help. Be willing to reach out and let somebody know you're struggling with something. 
because there's a lot of people out there, there's a lot of resources out there that are willing to, to come together, receive that gift. One of the biggest challenges is people think that they have to be alone in this, that they are alone, and that's not true. It's the furthest from the truth. If you're under the impression that you have a family member or a friend that's struggling with that as well, we have to be able to offer help. We have to be able to bring that to the front and have honest conversations with them. Our identity and our worth is not tied up in money or assets or the result of a crop. That's, that's not our identity. The value of their life is, is what matters. that video at the NDC, the Kansas Ag Stress.org website. One of the actions that we took in 2019 was to launch that website, and it is geared towards agriculture community. We did not create, we are, we are not mental health specialists. Um, we did not develop any resources, but we pulled together existing resources that the state has, that our federal partners have, that some of our communities have, to provide a, a website where you could go and you could find resources that were presented in a way to reach those in agriculture. Um, stress impacts everybody in a family. Um, it's not just the, the producer, the farmer, the rancher. It's the spouse, it's the kids, it's generational. Um, by nature, agriculture is stressful. We know that, I'm sure we'll hear from some of our panelists today about some of the stresses um, in their lives, but there's a lot of things that, agri that farmers and ranchers can't control. First off, there's the weather. We are very thankful that there were rain showers um, that I saw as we transitioned from one room to the next. Um, we can't control the weather, that's a given. Um, we can't control the markets. Uh, the pro commodity prices that our ranchers and farmers and ranchers have to take is really largely out of their hands. Those are two of the largest factors that will determine whether a farmer or a rancher is successful. And they can't control those. So those are just two. They often work at home. You can't leave work. Work is home. Your coworkers might be family. If you yelled at somebody while you're fixing that, that planter, um, you have to go and have dinner with them. You might have to go to bed with them. Um, you can't step away. It's not a normal job. Um, Nick touched on this, we find our identity in what we do. We are generational farmers. I'm, I come from a long background of farmers. I hope that I'm trying to instill my children the aspiration to be involved in agriculture. But that's a lot of weight on our shoulders. If we're thinking about, I might lose this crop because of the weather, it hasn't rained. I might disappoint my, my father. I might disappoint my grandfather. I might disappoint a, a man in my past or a family member in our past who was never, I've never even met, but I know put blood, sweat, and tears into what I have today. That is an additional stress that farmers and ranchers carry that not everyone carries in their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, on top of that, agriculture is dangerous. We're working with large equipment. We have access to chemicals. Um, there's a lot of dangerous situations that we are faced with, and as Dana mentioned in the numbers, they're not just looking at suicides, but they're looking at those hospital, those emergency room items. You can make things look like an accident on the farm because accidents happen. Um, so when we start talking about stress in agriculture, I think it's important to remember some of these things. Um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture is here to help destigmatize, to help be a partner. Um, to help facilitate that conversation. Um, and we, we look forward to, to making an impact. I know we're making an impact. And, I, and seeing the number of people here today who are interested in enrolling, I, I greatly appreciate that. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I look forward to, to further discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to mention two things before we launch into our I get the groups mixed. This is a panel, this is the tour group. I gotta keep it straight. 
Um, this morning, we began early uh, uh, with our tour group. We went to the farm of Dylan Bryant. Dylan, please. <laughs> Dylan is a registered pharmacist who works at the uh, pharmacy that uh, operates within our mental health center. Um, he has uh, another, uh, well, that's one of his day jobs. He also has a ph farm operation, 1,200 acres southwest of Hayes. Um, and he and his wife are connected, uh, are partners in from Family Farms in the Colby area. Uh, also, when he has extra time, he is a major in the Colorado Air National Guard. So he has a few things. So Dylan uh, allowed us to visit him and his neighbors this morning. Uh, I think it was very eye-opening. We stood around the pickup and talked about what these producers are experiencing uh, from cost of inputs, uh, cost of uh, prices, uh, the generational issue, which is huge in terms of trying to keep the family farm in the family, even to people who take extraordinary means, taking their own life for the life insurance payment to pay off the farm, to keep it in the farm. It's, I hate to say it, but it's a reality. So Dylan uh, let us visit. We uh, talked at length with the, uh, the tour talk with Dylan, Dylan with them, and I think uh, unfortunately, we don't have the pictures available to the tour, but I do have to say I arranged for a cow to be loose on the county road on the way out, and Kim was just exuberant about that. Sent it to a, a work meeting in New York, I think. He goes, look at this! <laughs> so, uh, Dylan, we appreciate actually having boots on the ground, literally, this morning with your kids running around, chickens running around, and hearing. Often we don't listen to the people that are actually boots on the ground, and we need to do that more. I think that's one of the critical learnings I've had from this. One of the producers mentioned, you know, he self coaches, and what they find is often helpful is resources to help them self coach. And so it really spurred me to think about that. And we had some conversations immediately about that. We talked about televideo, how that's helpful. We were serving some folks out on tractors with telepsychiatry out there in the field. So Dylan, we appreciate your uh, sharing today so much. So without further ado, we have a great panel here. Uh, they are limited to five minutes. We may run a little long today. Does anyone object to that terribly? Maybe three, fifteen? Okay, so. Because I know some of these people have a proclivity to talking a little longer. But we have one of our staff here with a five minute timer who will help them. We know that's a short amount of time, but uh, give your elevator speech and uh, about what you perceive issues and solutions, but help educate us and our guests on ag, introduce yourselves. Uh, you, uh, so without further ado, we'll turn to the panel. All right. I think Walt had me go first because he knows he can rely on me to be sure. So my name is Brenda Seaman, and my husband and I both come from families who have farmed in Kansas for four and five generations. Some of our ground was homesteaded by some of those ancestors that's been talked about back in the late 1800s. We live on our farm in, in Smith County where we have raised our five children. We've also raised cows and calves and dry land, pretty dry land this year, crops as well as alfalfa. So mostly cow-calf, but also crops. Um, I've worked for High Plains as a clinical social worker for the last 22 years. I know, I started when I was very young. Yeah, My 10 years old, ten it's at a, least, it's right? a program. Yeah, a program, a child labor program. Right. <laughs> uh, my, my role for most of that time, I've been pleased to oversee our community-based services for kids and families. 
And this is, I supervise case management staff who go out into homes and schools and communities and work with children and adolescents who are dealing with significant mental illness. It can be behavioral disturbance, emotional disturbance, um, and we support their families as well. So this is my role there. So kind of in the juxtaposition between farm and mental health, I've seen firsthand the stressors that occur that have occurred in our own family, that have occurred in our extended family, and in the communities around us, and in those that we serve. Um, we see how this negatively impacts not only mental health, but physical health, relationships, relationships in families and communities. Historically, farmers are a resilient bunch. We just are, and has, as has been said, we deal with things that are not in our control. Commodity prices, input prices, weather, um, government policies that change, and so we're used to that. What I see has been happening recently, and in the, probably the last 10 years or so, is really a dwindling of the resources that help us to be resilient. And by that I mean our communities, our connectedness, and our growing isolation. So, you know, farmers are often working now second jobs, as has been said, second, third, maybe fourth jobs off the farm. There's no time to gather in those informal settings that we used to do. Drink a cup of coffee at the local elevator or co-op and talk about mutual stressors, mutual joys, and, and spouses are also often working off the farm. So there's that aspect to the time and to the isolation. Many farms have had to grow larger to survive. So this means there's a geographical distance, not as many hiccups on the road, neighbors to wave at, some farmers aren't even living on the farm. So with that, our rural communities have also lost population and so access to natural resources that would be their supports. So isolation, in my view, together with difficult financial times can create despair, hopelessness, and a loss of shared purpose. And really, when you're doing a really tough job, loss of shared purpose, that's a deal, right? So there's a significant risk, like has been said on our video, that no one may recognize the seriousness of the problem. They might not recognize that their neighbor or their family member is struggling. And just to speak a little bit to the generational thing, farmers are aging. And so what it used to be, you know, grandfathers, fathers, uncles, you know, kids working on the farm together, the weight of this now can be on the farmer alone because it's no longer as financially viable sometimes to hand that farm down. So kids are working off the farm. So that weight is, le is resting on that individual alone. So as a local service provider, it's too often then at the point of crisis that we really can see and help and intervene. So we must be able to proactively sustain our outreach programs that can educate, identify those at risk, and really bring the mental health supports to those at risk, those men and women who feed the world. Brenda, thank you. Just go ahead and pass it on to okay. Jesse. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I wrote out my stuff because I'm very um, passionate about this and I will cry. Um, but um, I am are just, you? Yeah, who I are you? <laughs> I know, I will cry, but um, I'm Jesse Worrell. I'm from a farm in Kerwin, Kansas. And I'm proud that we do have a multi-generational farm out there. My husband and I um, are on there with many of his family. But I'm a farm wife, a homeschool mom, a farmer's daughter, a 2012 graduate of the agronomy department at Kansas State, a hospital board chairman, and a self-proclaimed behavioral health advocate. I grew up on a farm near, um, in Morris County, Kansas, near Dwight, where my parents taught me the value of hard work and the importance of family. In high school, I decided I wanted to stay involved in agriculture, but I didn't think I wanted to farm full time. So naturally, I went to college and fell in love with a farmer, also studying agronomy. That has quickly become nine and a half years of marriage, a daughter who loves reading, and a son who farms on the carpet. <laughs> Through the past few years, I have seen the ups and downs of agriculture and know the stories that my dad and his dad passed down to me. Two and a half years ago, I sat on a panel where we talked about the stresses in agriculture and the hope that we could make a difference in the mental health of our families, friends, colleagues, and beyond. When I, asked, when I was asked to be on this panel, I reached out to a few of my friends and talked to them about what they felt made the agriculture lifestyle so tough. 
We all agree that separating from the farm and your home life, that's nearly impossible. One of my friends is a very successful veterinarian, farm wife, and mom. She brought up the subject of losing animals on the farm. Anyone who has raised livestock can think of a time that they put all their blood, sweat, and tears into saving an animal, and they lost them anyway. In April, I watched my husband and father-in-law father do everything they could to save a heifer that wasn't able to birth her calf. I will never forget the broken feeling of that moment as I sat next to her outside the pen and talked to her and just begged her to get up so they could help her. Um, ultimately, she and her calf didn't make it, and my husband was left thinking about what he could have done differently. The what-ifs of agriculture. Imagine moments like that building up day after day. Tomorrow it might be a bolt that breaks on the baler and that keeps them from finishing before supper and they miss out on time with their family. And then the guilt comes. When it comes to the biggest stressors on the farm, it's different for everyone. My mom would say the unknown of prices is the most stressful thing for her. The farmer has very little control over prices. Inputs are expensive. There are always decisions to be made. Will the price of fertilizer go up or down by the time it is needed? Can I afford to buy it now if I fear it'll go up? Should I sell my grain now or wait for the possibility of a better price? My dad worries about drought and the chance of fire starting if the ground is dry. Last fall, he lost the whole building because of this, and the trauma of that has just made it worse. My husband worries about the weather and how it affects what he can get done. And I stress about supporting my husband and the farm while still taking care of a house, two kids, and everything else I'm responsible for. I have served on our county hospital board for five and a half years. My experience with behavioral health on the healthcare side has made me aware that the need is much greater than anyone can imagine. I am proud of what our hospital has done in Phillips County to address the need. One example is Robin Burwell, who is a nurse practitioner, primarily who was a nurse practitioner, primarily covering our emergency room in Phillips County. She saw the need for more behavioral health services and had the passion to address just that. After going back to school to become a psychiatric nurse practitioner, she is proud to provide mental health services in a small town. She works hand in hand with our behavioral health consultant, Carmen Engelke, who offers counseling at our clinic. They both offer telehealth appointments to make it easier for patients to fit care into busy schedules from home or maybe even from a tractor. We also have a program called Senior Life Solutions, which is an outpatient behavioral health program for the uh, 65 and older population. This is just another program that our administration, employees, and board have implemented to further access to, uh, further access to behavioral health. Access to mental health services is a struggle for most Americans. Wait times to see a professional can be two weeks, 10 weeks, eight months, or even longer. These are real wait times that I've heard from people here in Kansas. First, how is someone who is struggling expected to wait that long to get help, and how do they feel if they are just put on the back burner? Second, in the case of a farmer or rancher, there is absolutely no way they could commit to an appointment that far out. It is also not easy for them to admit that they might need help. This is why it is so important to highlight telehealth services for farmers and ranchers. Help can be sought without going into the clinic. It is private and more comfortable for a person who's not used to thinking about themselves. And so I just want to acknowledge everyone here for coming and listening because as Dwight D. Eisenhower said a long time ago, farming is easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from a cornfield. So thank you for being here. Amen. Well, good afternoon. My name is Angel Romero, Jr. I am from Dodge City, Kansas, and I am a hemp farmer. I've been an industrial hemp farmer for the last two years, and just saying that alone should acknowledge how much stress I probably am under right now, right? <laughs> Because they come up to me and it's like, why are you growing hemp? Well, let me tell you why I grow hemp. I am the co-founder of Stug Go Crete in Dodge City, Kansas. I build natural buildings, natural houses with industrial hemp, with hemp cretes. And that alone takes uh, 2.5 acres for 1,500 square foot house. 
So I have to at least have that at the end of every season if I want to build a home or build a structure for the next years to come. And in Kansas, it's been very stressful considering the fact of the permit license uh, costs when it comes down to that. There's a lot of different regulations you have to follow. I've never thought I had to pass all these background checks and all of these pay all everything that just comes like when February comes I'm like okay I'm this is my life now <laughs> this is what I have to do and you know being in Dodge City Kansas luckily they're a little bit more okay with the industrial hemp side of things they're actually very helpful the community is but I still have to have a three foot by three foot sign on the end of my property that says I am growing industrial hemp this is my industrial hemp license this is exactly what I'm doing because if not like my first year that I grew I constantly had police sheriff all kinds of people coming out to my property and saying mm-hmm you know what you're growing there kid <laughs> yes I may be a first generational farmer and farming isn't something that I was very comfortable with but I had 65 acres of farmable land on my property and when my parents got divorced I had a I had a choice to make and my choice that I made was I wanted to grow something. I wanted to grow hemp, because I saw a good, liable future in hemp. And with the farm that we have created and with the farm that we have now, we have been very fortunate enough to be able to create a nonprofit organization as well called Educate, Education Growers Development Company in Dodge City, Kansas. We are a nonprofit organization. I am actually the spokesperson of the nonprofit organization. And what they do is they invite anybody that wants to know about industrial hemp to our farm. We invite them out, we let them experience the farm life, whether they have experience or not. We say grab a handful of seeds and come with us. We'll show you how to grow something. No experience needed. And that's the beauty of this plant, but that's also the hard thing about convincing farmers to grow this plant. Everybody thinks hemp this, hemp that, it's ditch weed. You know, it's more than that. It can do thousands of thousands of different things from growing itself to making food, to making animal feed, to making clothing, to making houses. The, it, the evidence is all there. And anybody who would like to talk more about industrial hemp and hemp creep building, please, please come find me. I'll talk your ear off all day. This is something that I've been very dedicated in. Thankfully, this year we now have 10 acres in Dodge City. Another bad thing is, you know, we can't control the weather. The drought's been pretty hard over there in Dodge City. So unfortunately, I did lose five acres this year. But the awesome also other part of it was I did grow this year alongside the Kansas Hemp Consortium. And they graciously gave me a gra some grant money to help with the operations of being able to grow more industrial hemp, not only in Dodge City, but in Southwest Kansas. Because as a cover crop, as a good crop to help just move everything and re revitalize the soil, you know, that's a lot of benefits that this plant has. So anybody who wants to know more about industrial hemp, my name is Angel Romero Jr. Once again, thank you all very much for having me here today. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Christine Fisher. I am the medical director of First Care Clinic, which is the federally qualified health center in Hayes, Kansas. I grew up on a dairy farm in central Minnesota, so I understand all of these stressors. And so when I transitioned to First Care Clinic about five years ago, I realized the importance of combining medical health with behavioral health. And so we have an integrative behavioral health practice. And so when patients uh, come in, we not only take their vital signs, but we take their behavioral health vital signs and do depression screening on every person, every visit. And we do this because uh, it's behaviors that actually determine health outcomes. And so if depression is driving alcohol use, is driving tobacco use, is driving you know, overeating, sedentary lifestyle, uh, the, the rate of diabetes will go up, the hypertension will go up, strokes, heart attacks, etc. 
will, will increase. And so if we don't deal with the behavioral health aspects of health, we will not improve their overall health outcomes. And certainly if we don't screen for depression, we will have suicides. And so that is the basis of our medical practice is to be sure we take care of the behavioral health aspects, the psychological aspects of, of care. And so, so we, with that, we thought, well, how best to, to integrate this into our, pra our practice? And we realized the behavioral health vital signs were an important piece. Uh, but then we also add integrated health specialists, which are basically licensed counselors, so that if a person screens positive for depression, as part of the visit, the integrative health specialists come in and talk to the patients and have a brief intervention. So it is at the point of care. They, they can't get away. So we've got them at that point. And, and we love that because setting up appointments, people don't like to come back to talk about, uh, oh, I'm, I'm depressed, I've got suicidal thoughts, etc. But if it's like, oh, you know, this is just part of the visit, it's included in your visit, they will stay for that. And so we can do those suicide interventions, for example. Uh, we then added a next tier of therapy for uh, traditional counseling sessions, our long counseling sessions for the, the deeper trauma, the, the larger problems, to make sure that they had access to that, both in person and telehealth, which you right is, is extraordinarily important because they love the privacy. They don't want to come in and say, I'm here for a behavioral health appointment, but if you talk to them on the tractor, they're fine with it. And so we love that aspect. And then with that, the third tier of therapy we had to add uh, was a, a, a telehealth psych nurse practitioner for the medication management. Because if there's a hole in medical school treatment, or excuse me, in medical school teaching and nurse practitioner teaching, it's unfortunately, it's, it's, re, it's re revolving around behavioral health and behavioral health medication management. Very, very poor teaching, unfortunately. And yet it's this huge problem. And so we found ourselves realizing that, you know, we, other than the basic uh, medicines for, for anxiety and depression, we didn't feel like we had the expertise to treat some of these higher levels of depression. And so we reached out to a telehealth provider and our psych nurse practitioner is actually up in North Carolina. And she does an amazing job. It's all telehealth, of course, and the patients just love it. And so it really helps our practice to be very well-rounded in not only the counseling aspects, but also the medication aspects. And so if there's one thing going forward that I would strongly, strongly recommend is to really fulfill and supplement and support those behavioral health, telehealth uh, features and, and support those efforts in rural communities. They're uh, very well accepted. It's a financially feasible uh, method. The accessibility is excellent, and so I'd strongly recommend that. And then the other component, if there would be support for adding more behavioral health, uh, integrative type practices uh, into the state, when we could have uh, counseling at the point of care in terms of licensed counselors and clinics. I think that would be extraordinarily helpful. Hi, so I'm Dr. Lauren Mack. I'm a veterinarian, um, and I'm the practice owner and veterinarian in Plainville, Kansas, and Phillipsburg, which is north of here. And I'm going on, we're doing the math that, about eight or nine years here as well. And so uh, my, my world is a little bit different. Um, I am married to a mental health professional and therapist, so our dinner conversations are fascinating. <laughs> um, we can believe what we talk about for fun. So, you know, have that sort of perspective that a lot of my profession doesn't, but is working towards. In my day-to-day, -day, you know, ironically, everybody thinks veterinarians work on animals, but I actually just talk to people all day. Um, and I tell every student who goes to vet school, because they love animals, they need to go because they love people. And I might have discouraged a few. And so, and it's building those relationships. So farmers are not, I'm going to put this out there, the most trusting people either. Everyone's always trying to get something from them, whether it's money or it's seed, and everybody wants it at the lowest price. And that's a discouraging position to be in. So a lot of my job is to go out and say, hey, is this what you want it to be? How can I help you? How can I be your partner? And what that turns into over time, and trust me, it takes time, 
I've been in Plainville for eight years and in Phillipsburg for two, and the, the differences are impressive. And it just takes time where you learn their firm family. They know my son's name. I get Christmas gifts from them. I know who passed. Like they become an extended part of your world and mine in them. And so, you know, we, we are on, on farm face to face talking about hard conversations and economics and cows and, and life very often. And let me tell you, when you pride 300 cows in a row, you gotta find something else to talk about. <laughs> because you start running out of cow things to talk about. And it is really awkward to just stand there and stare at each other for three, four, five hours, right? So you learn all kinds of things. And having a spouse that's a mental health professional does seem to open that door where people will tell me things because somehow by proxy I'm qualified or not. And, and essentially what I've learned is they don't trust a lot of people and they have to feel like you're not taking anything from them. And they don't trust people who give them things for free for many obvious reasons. And so, you know, we've been doing this for years, and then in December, we talk about the Four Counties fire. Um, my clinic was, was heavily and deeply involved in that fire for months. Um, I sent patients home in February. We did over $25,000 worth of work for free, paid for by donations, thank goodness, um, and watched families that we'd worked with for years lose everything. And I can tell you to this day, when the lunch siren goes off, God, shoot that thing. Um, it still panics my team. We all still jump and someone goes, noon, it's the noon whistle, nothing's on fire. Um, and Jesse and I have had multiple encounters with, hey, there's a fire here, and, and, and contacting people and having that sort of experience. And, and to this day, I, I can tell you that you have to get up close and personal to, to make a difference. Um, and so all these resources are wonderful, but you have to convince people that one, you're not taking anything from them, you're legitimately giving them something and they should do it. You know, we talk about the, this generational weight, but in my clinic we call it the weight of legends. Because when you stand shoot side, the legend is grandpa, sometimes he was wrong and I'm still trying to convince you he was wrong. <laughs> 10 years later. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, sometimes it's, it was great grandpa, or it was the neighbor down the road that only this person remembers, but it's the weight of legends. And so you don't only have an obligation to your family to keep farming, but to the whole region and to your children, and the, the list becomes vast. Thank you. Um, and that weight of legends is also paired with a lack of secession planning. I see a lot of significant substance abuse. I see a lot of significant psychiatric issues, um, damaged marriages that don't help anybody. And it's a very kind of thin line that we walk. And so when we talk about therapy in the tractor, that's kind of something we talked about two and a half years ago at a panel similar to this, where I was like, you have to go to the person, offer them help, and say, I'm, I need nothing from you in return. And that's your chance. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Bohr, and I'm an agriculture extension agent for K-State Research and Extension. Um, my area is the Cottonwood District, which is the Barton and Ellis counties. Um, one of the main things that I do do with um, K-State is I'm on a transdisciplinary team for mental health and stress, and I'm one of the leaders on that with the agriculture background. Um, some of the things that we have done to try to address what's going on in the areas is we have people that are trained in the mental health first aid, in QPR, which is question, pursue, and refer, which is kind of like CPR. Um, if enough people know how to keep a heart going, then more lives are saved. If enough people know the signs of mental health stress, then more lives will be saved and then also the Michigan State University Farm and Stress Training. Um, one of the major things that we are working on currently is a curriculum and a short program that agents can, anybody can use in their programs. Um, I call it kind of, for lack of a better term, a bait and switch. I created a program back in 2018 and it was just, how do you notice that your buddy is struggling? Because most farmers, don't want to admit that they're struggling, but they will do move mountains to save their buddy. 
And so while we were having a meal, I would sit there and say, okay, you're stuck, sorry, but you need to hear this and I know you weren't gonna come just for this program. And so I would give a short 10 minutes and one of the things that our local mental health in Great Bend called the center has is a business card and I would lay them out and it says, how are you feeling today? You can scan the QR code and it takes you to a mental health screening. So people could quietly do it or they could do it to try to help somebody else, which is kind of the aspect that I go through is how to get your buddy in, uh, into help. Um, also with um, K-State, um, a lot of transitionary um, problems are happening. And so we, they have started a new department um, through grants that is for succession farming. So to help people and one of the programs that I've had in the past and brought people in is how can you still have Thanksgiving dinner? We constantly treat our multi-million dollar businesses as small family farms and it's very hard when you have to make a decision and not everybody agrees and then you have to sit down to dinner. So it's how do you save your holiday dinners but also still run your business correctly. Um, so that is a new department that is opening. They are working on having it. And we also have other programs that I have referred farmers to, um, Kansas Agriculture Mediation Center, which any farmer can call. It's, everything is based on a sliding scale, and we have lawyers, we have facilitators, we have mediators that can come in and with what you can afford, even if you can't afford anything, and be able to work with families on different stressful aspects, such as succession, such as bankruptcy, restructuring. Um, we were talking about earlier, somebody said that some farmers have committed suicide and made it look like an accident just to save the family farm. There are other options, and so we try to get it out there that these other options are there. And so our goal is for all of our programming, or most of our programming coming forward, we'll have a mental health aspect to it just to continuously bring that to the forefront and continuously talk. Thanks, Lich. Hi, I'm Erin Petersilly. I am the Assistant Director for Kansas Farm Bureau Health Plans. So to give you just a little bit of background, um, I do come from that farming background as well. So before we talk about the Farm Bureau side of things, I do come from the, fam um, from the family farm. I am married to the sixth generation on that family farm, and I am raising the seventh generation. So when you start talking about stresses, we've talked a lot about where is it at with our parents and, and, and where are we at you know, on the husband, wife, and all those sort of things. But Jesse mentioned raising two kids, and, and that's where we are. I've got a 14 and 11 and an 11 year old, and I will tell you that those kids have seen more death, trial, frustration, okay? Um, we'll, we'll use the 14 year old as an example. He has a small business loan from the USDA. He purchased a barn, he raises pigs, he farrows out those pigs, and he has had times where we have lost litters. He knows what it means to make nothing. Um, he knows what it means to get by. He, he's done the numbers. Uh, but so much so that he came, he's like, so mom, I think I need about 200 pigs. <laughs> you do what? Well, he'd done the numbers. So at what point could he scale up to make this um, a more feasible operation? I'm sorry, buddy, you're 14. At a certain point, we're just going to keep this really small. Um, so it's something that is in their blood. It's just, it is what happens. Um, but so much so on our farm, if we um, talk just a little personally, we have a saying of, I love you like a dead cow, okay? And sometimes that means I really love you, okay? And so much so that I've, you know, I've really tried to save your life and, um, because you are trying to save animals like Jesse talked. And sometimes it's a, I love you, and now I have to deal with the dead cow and figure out where I'm going to bury it at and deal with the aftermath and all those sort of things. Um, so we do use um, I love you, sometimes followed up um, like a dead cow, and sometimes it means lots of different things. So when we talk about the Kansas Farm Bureau aspect of this, um, we are definitely talking about a statewide organization that has over 100,000 members, and that ability to really reach the grassroots part of this. So we talk a lot about policy, 
And our thing as of late is we don't want to be the mental health professionals. That's not the arena we are in. But how do we, we're really good at bringing people to the table. And how do we get the right people in the room so that we have these conversations um, so that yes, when you're shoot side or you're in the tractor or whatever it may be, um, that we can really start supporting our members. So we look at things from a policy standpoint. We also look at things um, from a community partner and we partner a lot with K-State Research and Extension with some of those, um, especially as we're developing, like you said, the Michigan uh, piece and how we do some ag stress. But one of the other things that we do have within Kansas Farm Bureau is Kansas Farm Bureau Health Plans, and that's where I am in charge. We cover 13,000 lives across the state of Kansas with this um, health program and with this health plan. And my number one question that I get is, do you cover mental health? Followed up by maternity. Okay, so yes. We do, and people want to know what that looks like and then where they can find help. So people are asking the questions, but like you've heard, it's very hard when we get out here to Western Kansas. So with that, i um, very excited to get to announce that we have been able to partner and bring on with, as part of our plans. So if you have one of our plans, you have um, the ability to use Talkspace. So that lets them meet where they're at so you can you know have that conversation with that counselor on the tractor in the farrowing barn and um, wherever you need to need to be that way so from the farm bureau standpoint we're looking at this from lots of different areas and and how can we support and how can we still come to the table and help you bring people to the table and get the message across Hi, my name is Will Stutterheim. I am a FHSU uh, psychology department professor. Um, oh, I'm also part of the Rural Resilience Coalition here um, as part of my job as well, um, which is very nice because it gives me a chance to still be involved with agriculture and being able to help uh, give those presentations uh, to people who are in need, uh, wanting to understand more about the stress response, rural resilience, things important like that. Um, I've also gotten the joys of being able to be part of Farm Bureau and their presentations as well. So I go out and give presentations, it gives me a chance to get to Manhattan, uh, eat some food I don't usually get to eat out here in Hayes. So it's, uh, it's a nice time to go and uh, uh, to hang out there. So all that's well and nice. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology um, and I, I feel like it keeps me very well versed in stress, resilience management, things along those lines. Uh, where my real expertise comes to play though is I was born and raised in Phillips County on a farm. So Phillips County I think is pretty, pretty, pretty well represented up here, which is great. Uh, it was really a, a great experience in my life, but I think this is one of the things that was a catalyst for me becoming a therapist. Because when I was in third grade, uh, we actually lost the family farm temporarily. Land prices, some issues going on along those lines, and it just became really hard in agriculture. And the impact I saw that have on my family. My father, who I'd never seen struggle with mental health issues before, uh, my family, which has always been fairly positive and upbeat, uh, the changes I saw occur in my family during that time, I definitely think was one of the forks in the road as to why I knew I wanted to become a mental health counselor later on in life. Uh, that was then cemented by about a year and a half later, uh, on our land when we finally got it back, we uh, are fortunate enough to have a railroad go right through the middle of our uh, farm as well. And so uh, back then, I don't think it was as well managed as it is hopefully now, uh, we had a fire burn up uh, about a fifth of our entire land. So when these four county fires and everything else came around this last time, I really got to see the impact and think back to that time and the stress and how everybody's there immediately during the fire, but then how quickly those resources are kind of lost. Uh, it's difficult to still be able to be uh, connected to other people during that time and, and just the resiliency that's needed to go through something like that. So uh, I also worked out in, uh, at High Plains Mental Health Center in Phillipsburg, Kansas for 13 years uh, as a counselor, seen a lot of people in agriculture and just people who were struggling with this type of mental health issues in Western Kansas. I really want to spend just the most of my time on the opportunities though that I see and I've really seen it start to take place in these last couple of years. The stigma is really starting to change in agriculture around mental health. People are desperate to be able to 
understand mental health more, being able to understand those resources, how to help people who are struggling. So many times I hear in my life that the people that are around the people who are struggling don't know how to actually bridge the gap and have the conversations. And when I give these presentations at Farm Bureau and other places, I have a line of people afterwards stopping, coming up and asking me, uh, I, I've, got this, I've got this brother of mine who's struggling. I've got uh, my father who's struggling. We're dealing with succession planning, which is a huge part in terms of mental health struggles right now for families. Uh, so I think so much of this is that we really are in a place where the stigma is changing around it, and I think people are desperate for the resources. Uh, my biggest push, and if it was my elevator speech today, is just the matter of we need to get those resources out there to those people. Uh, in a way that is palatable, that, that keeps it around them. And also very much in a primary prevention kind of strategy, which I feel like right now the biggest part for me is that yes, there's people in their 50s and 60s who are struggling with mental health, but I also want to be able to address the 20 year olds who aren't struggling yet, who if we don't manage it now, 30 years down the road, we're back in the same problem having the same panel discussion. So I think there's so many things around this that are more primary prevention that I really try to focus on and getting those good resources out to, because I know those people are really interested in receiving that information and those services, along with still being able to help the people who are struggling in the moment. Hi, I'm Dwayne Keller. Um, I grew up on a family farm in Trigo County. I don't know why I'm here today, except <laughs> somebody asked me to be here. But sometimes I think in the last, um, Oh, six months, uh, we've been subjected to a lot of stress, and this friend of mine said, maybe I ought to do a little talking about it. But I grew up on a family farm in Trigo County. Uh, we were one of those that was part of the four county fire plus Trigo. So back in December, we lost our beautiful home. Um, 900 acres of farm ground burned. We had uh, 50 some thousand bushels of corn that burned up while we were in Kansas City looking for a home to buy down there because we wanted to live with our grandson or buy our grandson. So uh, uh, on the way home, we couldn't get home because of the 80 to 90 mile an hour wind, so we were stuck in Kansas City. Um, and the fire was burning out there. Didn't get our home that afternoon, but got it that night. And uh, we got a call, and uh, our daughter, and uh, she said, your home is gone. Well, we built the home 40-some years ago, and the kids helped. So on the way home, I break up a little bit, but on the way home, I told my wife, I said, look in the back seat of the pickup. And she said, well, there's nothing back there but a couple of bags. And I said, well, that's all we got. So, but on to the happier part. So when we get home, our home's gone, our land's burnt and all that, but thanks to a lot of good friends and people that helped us, uh, I think we've done okay. Uh, it's sort of therapeutic to talk about it today and everybody that comes up to talk to you about it, I think it does us more good than it does the people that ask us the question because uh, each time it gets easier. But uh, I think uh, out of tragedies come opportunities. Uh, I think our family's stronger. I think my son and my daughter appreciate us a lot more and they appreciate what we have. Uh, I tell people on a, on a happy side, how many people at 74 years of age get to build a brand new home and put all new crap in? <laughs> <laughs> and the insurance company's going to pay for it. I mean, I'm sure if I would have bought a lottery ticket that day, we would have won. You know, because how lucky could you be? Well, I know that sounds corny, but that's the attitude you have to have when your life gets turned around in an hour two hours. Uh, so uh, 
So there's a lot of stress out there. Uh, so we're farming. Um, you know, I was an engineer for Gleaner, designed combines, lived in Kansas City, moved home, back to our family farm, because we wanted to raise our kids on a farm. And uh, that was all good. Um, they're great kids because of that. Uh, back to the family issues, uh, neither one of them wanted to farm. But they all went off and did other things. But uh, so um, farming, the stress on a farm. Uh, we had our loss. Uh, but if you had a regular job, how many of you would just want to wake up one morning and when you look at the markets that afternoon, you've lost two hundred thousand dollars? You know, but you still eat supper that night. You know, you still move on. Or um, you go in to buy your fertilizer in the last year and it's up four times what it was the year before. But you still write the check. You still buy the fertilizer. I think <clears throat> that's sort of a definition of a farmer. You know, you do it anyway. And uh, so I'm just saying in, <clears throat> in a very short time, your life can get turned around. Uh, but I think the strength we've had is how it can change us for the better and what we can do. Uh, so uh, not all stress is bad, uh, but it does challenge you, and uh, that's it. Appreciate your sharing that, and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you. I just want to say I think that's the epitome of what I've heard all day: that producers are resilient. Someone said this morning, their grandpa used to say, "The corn won't wait for you to get up to turn on the irrigation. <laughs> you got to just get back to it." But something you said too is talking about it is so helpful. And uh, so thanks for sharing. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, something that the, the guy that referred you here, <laughs> Bill Ring, said that he was eating supper with you. And you mentioned some of the long-term impacts of fire that we don't think about in terms of the ash really impacting the ability of the soil to produce because of changing the alkalinity. Yeah, I, I've talked about that a little bit if y'all want to hear it. But so our land bird, okay? And I have this little analogy between a rancher and a farmer. I'm a farmer. <laughs> so the rancher lost his cows. And this is not, I, so he had to go shoot his cow, okay? if they hadn't already died. So when my land burned, that land was ruined. I mean, a lot of my ground is in the bar ditches of the neighbors, and for about two months out there, I didn't have a neighbor that liked me because we had a five or six mile dust storm because of all the land blowing. And uh, so I had this one particular quarter, uh, talked with all the K-State people, and they said, you need to get something out there on it. So I planted it. Well, it blew, so I had to undercut it, Jeff. And then they said, well, you ought to plant triticale. Well, I planted triticale, and about two weeks later, a windstorm came and blew it all out. So I bought another set of cows and put them on there when I planted the triticale, and all of those cows died. You get my drift a little bit? So not only did I have to shoot one cow, I had to shoot two. Well, then they said, well, you just need to plant Milo on it. Well, I planted Milo on it, and two weeks after the Milo was about like that, another windstorm and blew it all out. So now I'm on my third set of animals, and God's great, I planted Milo, and it's growing. <laughs> so <laughs> just had to keep doing it. Just have to keep at it. Yeah. But sometimes when you just can't keep at it, what we find is, you know, you got to reach out for help, or someone has to reach out to you. So uh, I appreciate you coming so much. I want to call out something about the after effects of the fire. And I, 
I want to be cautious and respectful of those of you who experienced it, but there were many tragedies with animals. Um, t terrible, terrible situations that trauma, I think, will go on for a long, long time. Uh, other stories I want to go into about losing horses and it's just horrible. But I also want to mention first responders. I have Mr. Hirsch here who um, is involved in Firefighters Association. And what those guys did in that was just um, incredible. You know, I listened on the scanner to all that they did and all that they went through. And so it affected more than losing your house, it affected your neighbors. You know, it's pervasive. Um, and um, it has really impacted many dimensions that you wouldn't even think. The, the, the comment about the moon siren going off, I, you know, we just have to be so thoughtful about that. So uh, I want to call out a thank you to uh, the Schmidt Foundation here who helped underwrite this event and who's helping us record this event. We hope to have some recordings of pieces of this for public education, therapist education, so our therapists understand these issues, uh, public information, various pieces. So the Schmidt Foundation was very helpful in helping to underwrite some of the costs of the meal and, and doing this, so very appreciative. So I'd like to turn to the next, uh, kind of the next page of our discussion and that is giving our tour members the chance, if you're interested in asking any, I feel like Phil Donahue here, but asking any of the uh, panel uh, questions. That's, those are policies that have really opened up the last couple. Talk about adversity, you know, with COVID into some opportunity that really grew, um, you know, telemedicine through phones, not just videos, you know, the telephone, just being able to talk to someone. So it's so impactful to hear um, your experience, you know, and uh, the help that that can be um, to hear about talk a lot about so so happy that High Plains Mental Health Center is really you know an amazing resource in a 20 county area um, focusing on integrating health care you know so folks you know wherever they're comfortable can get the care they need whether that's at the FQHC or at High Plains or at the hospital you know um, Since you raised the, the issue of continuing the opportunities to, in as many ways as possible, deliver telehealth, mm -hmm. after the COVID emergency, we would urge you to consider doing that uh, permanently. Uh, if you have any influence on that, it makes, all, I don't know how many times you've heard telemedicine called out here. Uh, it's critically, critically important. So, other questions? I have a couple comments and, and a couple questions. So, great. We can be patient. I, I, I want to acknowledge because everyone did mention telehealth, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that Kansas played a leading role in the development of telehealth, right? Dr. Cox from right here in Hayes right. was an innovator way back. So, you guys have been doing it for a long time and you've shown us all. Um, throughout the state how to do it. So um, you started it. <laughs> Good work. Obviously there's some things we can do to expand that. I have a couple questions for uh, folks who aren't on the panel but who spoke earlier. Um, Dana, who was talking about 
Is Dana still here? Okay, she's over there. The, you mentioned the Kansas Violent Death Reporting System. Is that data publicly available, and do you have county level data for that?
So I think it really speaks to revitalizing rural communities in general. So of course I have the farm thought, but it's rural communities in general. So programs that bring, um, I know my son is a junior, senior high principal, and he is always talking about recruiting like people back to Osborne County, for example. And so why do you do this? Because what is valuable there for you? You know, is it the lifestyle people mentioned, you know, coming back to the family farm or coming back to the rural to raise their kids? But what is there for you? What are the tele, how, what is remote work? How can we get people? We have people actually in our community that do work in, Can they work in Osborne County, but they're working for a firm in Kansas City. So more of that, and I mean, that kind of speaks to the marketing piece of that as well. So just more young kids in the, in the programs and schools, I think that just grows from that, really from that grassroots. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I saw with the pandemic. There were a lot of urban people who wound up in rural Kansas. Right. Because they recognized that they were missing out on in-person, you know, interaction. And that's when I think rural Kansas really shined. Um, I hope that, I hope that some of those folks, you know, stick. And then if there's something we could do, if we, we, we can do as a, as a group to look for young farmers, for young farmer activities. I was really interested to hear of some of the projects and things because that's really the key. I mean, you look at the age group of our farmers, okay? And, and who can start yeah. with, you know, how, how much does a combine cost? We haven't bought a new combine for years and years, but down there on the end, how much does a new camp combine cost? Yeah. I just priced a couple seven hundred ninety thousand dollars. Okay, so three quarter, more than three quarters of a million dollars. Who can start? You need more than a combine. So, so there's the thing. So, and I'll add to that in high school, which is becoming further behind in my history. But um, I did a, a speech. My high school speech for FFA was about the family farm and the expenses and stuff. And at that time, which it was 2008, 2009 ish, um, a new combine was $250,000. So that can that tells you just how much that has increased. Right. Yeah. So this is sort of becoming interesting. I'm gonna add on to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rooks County is having a like medical professional crisis, and I've struggled with rural veterinarians, but we're struggling with supporting our awesome local hospitals. And so somehow I have become the point person to recruit a marketing company to help us build a community video and build community recruiting opportunities. That would be a great place to help these communities for the hospital and for the community. And the community video then can become my video to take recruiting. It can become the IT group. We have several people that can promote from, you know, work from home um, and trying to sort of say, come to Plainville because because um, otherwise we don't have anything. We have a website that's sort of run on the side. and It doesn't hold any appeal for our generation. And I'll finish with that as well because I'm actually, I'm 25 years old. I started my farm when I was, last year when I was 24. And my, the farm that we run is all Gaia Therapeutic Farm. We have one John Deere tractor that helps us do all of our rows and everything else, the 10 acres that we planted, we all planted by hand. Everything that we produce and get off the farm, we go out there, a group of my, me and my friends, a group of me and my farmers, young entrepreneurs that are just out there all, all day, all morning. I wake up at 6 a.m., 6.30 sometimes, and then I'm out there until like 10 p.m doing everything, maybe I go in to eat ever so often, because I need to do that, right? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that's, it's, it's, a real, it's a real struggle, and something that we had even talked about, if there was a way or a potential system for a farm sharing equipment or a mentorship program of which young entrepreneurs like myself can hop onto or can utilize to help us grow within our own craft as well, to make it easier for the future generations. Me as a young farmer, that is something that I would like to be a part of and would like to see more happening, especially in Kansas. Just being a huge in Kansas, that's what we are. We're farmers. So y'all are going to ask you this, and, and maybe, maybe it's you, but maybe it's the group. Do you, do you ever wonder, I wonder about this, because I grew up on a dairy farm, and like many generations of farmers, but do you ever wonder if, if, if some of the, the stress and mental health issues is owes in part to the fact that farmers are disconnected from the land? You know, because they 
things have become kind of industrialized. I mean, you're talking about working the land by hand, and that is a very different situation. You're out there getting the vitamin D, and you know, and hopefully, hopefully soon we'll be reaping the reaping what you sow. But is is that ever part of the discussion? Again? No, no, go right ahead. I mean that. That's a really lovely romantic concept, but unfortunately the margins don't allow us to do that at this point. And most of the ranchers, and this is no insult, are not his age. No. <laughs> I, 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 live in, I live in Chase County. You're, you're familiar. Uh, yeah. I live in a town in 900, I understand that. But I didn't know if that was ever part of the... I understand the reach. I understand the realities yes, of it. Yes, of course. But it is different now. Because it is it's different. Much different I think farmhouse. one of the things we talk about is how isolating so I've been out on a range and worked cattle, and I'm the first person they've talked to in like four days. Okay. Yeah. When COVID hit, I'd have guys come into town and be like, why is your door locked? Right. Yeah. What's happening? And I'm like, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> you don't have a smartphone. You, know, you hate smartphones. You keep you use a flip phone. They all fight over flip phones for some of them. Yeah. And yet she, she just acknowledged it. They don't like the smartphone. The news comes to them when, when they catch it. And it's a very isolated place. So when something happens, there isn't, you know, 10 people to sit and talk to and, and commiserate with and work with. Right. They're by themselves. And if you've ever spent all day working by yourself, you have a lot of time to convince yourself of all the things you've done wrong and all the things that are going wrong. And there's a, there's a lot of time to get to a place you shouldn't. And no one is stopping you. And so to make a, a plug for Community health centers. Is it on? Okay. It's on. It's it's on. on. Okay. So to make a plug for community health centers in all this, your original question about how to maintain communities and to make sure people people stay there, you have to have health care locally. And to do that, who you know, you can work in Kansas City or you can work in Hayes, you can work in Colby, you can work in Norton, and the draw to these larger centers is, is huge for younger people. And so to say, hey, you can have loan repayment, for example, and you can have some subsidized care through an FQAC, for example. Uh, those are very, very important stabilizing forces for small towns is to have community health centers. Thank you. So while farming may be very isolated, um, it's also important for us to remember that we're Kansas nice. Okay, and what does that really mean? So when we go, I mean, we have conversations, right? I mean, it's, so while it's isolating, it's not that you don't have conversations at the co-op, at the grocery store, etc. But, Lish, how are you doing today? Fine. Uh, there we go, right there. Fine. Okay. I'm fine. We, exactly. So, so we've done that, and that's all the further. And so then, and part of what uh, K State Research and Extension, when we're talking about using the Michigan um, stress model is teaching people how to reach people where they are and where and past fine. So are you prepared that when you ask that question, and it's hard, okay, I, I can tell you where I was standing when the gentleman told me exactly how things were going. So you have to be prepared that not only do you ask the question, but that you, um, you're, you're prepared for an answer. And then the next piece with this is we still have to go back to, as we've talked a lot about isolation in terms of building systems, have I seen my friend today? Okay, so if I know that I talk to Will three times a week and I have not talked to him three times a week or I haven't had the normal conversation three times a week with him, we've gotta be able to check up. Um, and that's, that's sometimes hard to do too because we, you do. I mean, we all get bogged down um, in the normal daily life and go, oh my goodness, I haven't heard from Will um, this normal time or what, what I have heard from him hasn't been normal. So we just have to think about some of those pieces as well. So I have a question about telehealth, related to telehealth. Can you speak a little bit about your broadband challenges here in the rural area? Because you to be able to do telehealth and continue to push. Um, somehow, we need to have that connectivity. So I want you to talk a little bit about that and then also um, speak about have you had any pushback from farmers, even with telehealth, or how effective those visits have been? Because I know for some folks, doing a telehealth visit, it is a struggle. 
even though it might seem so easy for a lot of us, it's just pick up the phone, you know, do a FaceTime or click on Zoom, there's a camera. There's a lot of things that you have to, if you're going to do a medical visit, you need to prep for. Um, so it's just that ease to it when you're having that conversation with that primary care or a mental health provider. So if you can just address those two things, that'll be great. So when we talk about broadband, and I live just south of here in Rush Center, uh, broadband has been huge. From a Kansas Farm Bureau um, side of things, we are we're sitting on those national um, committees um, to ha of how we expand that because it is such a piece. It guys, we don't operate without it anymore. So so I work from home, um, even though I do have an office in Manhattan. Rush Center, Kansas. This is what population 300, and that's probably counting the cats and dogs, maybe. Um, I have tremendous broadband. Um, better than what I could have had if I was um, in Manhattan because of the way they laid fiber. My house where I was living at in town at the time in La Crosse, so this is the county seat, okay, now we're up to a thousand people, right? Could not do what I'm doing today from my house in town in the county seat as what I was able to do um, just simply because of the way fiber was laid. Um, and who has access to that fiber? Um, because you start talking, when we start talking about fiber, you also have to think about Sprint, AT&T, who has the rights to um, some of those areas. So um, when you have time at the co-op, you, you talk to people and, and, we, and we spend a good time talking about fiber because the fiber happens to go right beside my farm. My neighbor, okay, he is a mile and a half away from me because of the way fiber is laid, he is across the road, AT&T will not allow him access to that because they own his spot. He is not allowed to have our rural Golden Belt uh, piece. So he will tell you that the challenges of this, because remember why we may not like smartphones, um, they're the ne whether it's a necessary evil, whether you love them, whatever it is. He goes, I have to check my markets at 6 a.m because by 6.30, there are too many people up and around and I can no longer do my business. So that's, so that, just to give you a picture of how, what it's like um, and not going a whole lot of distances um, at all. My neighbor to the other side of me, very crotchety, okay? Uh, this is not the person that you want to, you don't want to cross, um, I get along with them great. Um, but again, they're running fiber, they're running cable, they're doing all these sort of things. They're going to need to run this across his pasture. <laughs> so he goes to them and he goes, you know what? I won't cause you one piece of grief if you'll let me have internet at my house. He's not in their service area. So he's causing them grief. So he's causing them grief. Yeah. Okay. So, so that just hopefully gives you some um, things on the broadband side of this. When it comes to telehealth, um, because we do use it quite frequently, especially when we start talking about being able to offer talk space to people, it's great. It's wonderful to be able to use it from, from your place, but it's still a challenge because how do I know that I'm going to get the same person to, ha to build a connection with, and at what point, um, we don't have a whole lot of mental health providers, right? So how are they going to ever understand where I'm coming from, from agriculture? Uh, so one of the things, and this is definitely the pipe dream, this is down the road, as, as I told people, I go, this, this is our problem, talk space people. Like, not only do I need you to make sure that you can meet with these people on a regular basis, that they can, you can guarantee me that they're going to have the same counselor over and over, I need to know that your counselors have a tie to agriculture, and maybe not a tie, but have some sort of understanding. Um, so our goal is to eventually get those counselors out um, and be able to take kind of our master's class with us so that we can get them on the farm. We don't ever expect them to be fully immersed, um, you know, PhDs in agriculture, but if they can get the taste um, just like you guys did today in terms of being able to visit a farm and kind of see um, some pieces, that's going to be important for them as well. The other portion of that, and I'm again, married to that mental health professional, is, is mental health first aid training for the other people around. So I become the <laughs> in, unintentional therapist on a regular basis. And I've had numerous conversations yesterday 
was on farm and one of my ranchers was clearly out of character. I've known him forever. And I'm like, Kirk, what is going on? Are you okay? And he looks at me and he starts sobbing and I'm like, not okay. <laughs> and didn't know what I'd gotten myself into and we spent an extra hour on farm that I didn't have because he's a friend. And I am not a therapist. I've gone through a lot of schooling. This is not what I do. But in that particular instance, I have enough skills due to my, my proximity to it to at least make sure I'm like, okay, is he okay? Who, who's here to help him? How can we help him? But if you can arm the other people, Keep the co-op runners, the, the veterinarians, the, the other people that these people trust, you get a proximity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just medical professionals, because I can't tell you, no offense, how many farmers try to get me to fix their problem and not go see a doctor. Yeah. So do you think, I'm just asking, mm -hmm. are you saying that there might be a need for some crisis mental health training? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Every week yes. in my yes. life. Absolutely. Yes. And so that's coming. one thing that K-State is doing with like the transdisciplinary. The QPR is exactly what that is. If enough people have QPR training, which we have agents throughout the state that are certified in QPR, and basically it teaches just people in a room, it's a one hour program on how to identify if somebody is having a mental health issue and how to ask the questions, the correct questions. Don't leave it at, how are you? I'm fine. Are you okay? Are you, uh, yes. You are you suicidal? Yourself? That is a huge question that is so hard to say. And I constantly tell farmers, I would rather say, uh, have you asked that question than speak at your eulogy. Let me ask you a question. So, and I'm just talking about this because I've been to AA, NA, things. Is there, uh, are there opportunities, in, is there any type of opportunity for farmers to talk like that? Will they? <laughs> will, they? will they? I mean, I'm just asking. That's, because it yes, sounds like to me I don't know that what, what you're kind of saying, like that's the vet and different people that they're talking to you because yeah. they have a relationship with you. That's and why we're working. Where they are. And you're where they are. And you're where they are. You're standing on so your, one -on -one your property. Place, right? I'm on your property at your shoot on your territory. Yes. Yeah. And that's why telehealth <laughs> They're not going to talk about that. Your question. So. No, that is are not going to happen at the coffee there, shop. Farmer Joe? <laughs> <laughs> the farmers aren't going to talk about that at the coffee shop. No. Right. They oh, got yeah. too much ego, too much pride. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's so a lot of I'm, I'm trying to get information to take back to talk to the Secretary of that. So then, with telehealth, maybe uh, the broadband not being in certain areas, but in certain areas, will a farmer call 988? Better chance. If it's going to be hard. They know about it. No, they don't know about it right now. <laughs> That's what I think right there. Yeah. 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 His, his wife. I think this is where mine is too. That you know, this is where their wife will. This is where their daughter, their son, the people around him. If you want to talk about their local AA, it's going to be not them going to the donor shop and talking to other farmers at that time. It's going to be a brick wall. Yeah. Um, the wife who's concerned and has been concerned for the last six months, and we've given resources to and has found ways to be around that conversation, make mental health more of a regular conversation than just a, mm -hmm. hey, one time in the moment in a crisis. But if we can start to incorporate that into conversations, make it more comfortable, reduce that stigma, that's gonna be more that ability to make that movement because it's gonna be more in the orbit around that person who's struggling. How do you think we must do that? I think we give the resources to those, those people. And what I've noticed is I really do appreciate the conferences because people, will take time at a conference. Women managing the farm, I had standing room only when I was giving conversations about mental health. And I had to stay for another 45 minutes afterwards <laughs> just being able to give people information and hey, I'm struggling and how do I talk to my husband? And well, I do that, but then you know, he just, he just shuts down. And one of the biggest things is it's not a one-time event. It's not this one crisis that, that we do. There is that part. But then there's this other part where we start to make mental health just in the orbit of their conversations, just being able to have it there and available, being able to have different resources so they can associate it to different things. Like maybe for one person, 
being able to address it one way in terms of talking about stress is, is one way to do it. Talking about resilience, being able to give them a menu of options uh, for the people in, that support them and are around them is I think it'd be a key critical issue for the people who are struggling now. And again, when I go back to those 20 year olds who are gonna be 50 in 30 years, right, struggling if now. we can start to give them that yeah, information sure. now, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Hey, Will, do you mind if I and I would say yeah. that barriers, that if there are, if there's any barrier, so that's why I was going to answer also about telehealth, because if you finally have that conversation yeah. and you're going to get someone, okay, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to call the mental health center and we're going to get you in. And if there's like, okay, well, in this amount of time yeah. or you're first going to have to do this and then there's all this paperwork. Yeah. And so that's why we've made really good inroads with using telehealth, but you can get that you can get them where they are, and then, then you're going to have a chance. <laughs> but if you're like, okay, uh, two weeks from Tuesday, yes. you know, that's not happening because they're going to say, is it going to rain then or not? Mm -hmm. Am mm -hmm. I going to be able to, are the, is the cow calving, is this calving season yes. or not? Yes. So that's where yeah. you end up so, with yeah. where they're at, yes. more yeah. so than any population yeah. I know. Yes. <laughs> so. I had a brief conversation, I have a brief story for you. I was talking to a rep, a drug rep the other day, who's a good friend of mine, has been helping me in business for a long time. One of his prior best friends was part of this fire. And he's standing there and he's like, I just don't understand. The guy has a family, he's got beautiful children. And, and this is a good dude, this is one of my best friends. And he just, all he does is drink and he's trying to figure it out and he's messing up his marriage. And I stopped him and I was like, dude, he is struggling. Like, do you see that? And he goes, I'm like, I, I won't diagnose him, but the words depression and and trauma and all these things come up and I was like he is struggling and he looks at me and he goes well he has all these people around him who love him and I was like but do they know how to ask him if he's struggling and he goes no and I was like well welcome to what you get to do this afternoon right <laughs> and he's like well it is raining I can go hilariously um and I was like D have you asked him have, have you talked to him you said you were his best man at his wedding just because his wife hasn't tried or maybe she has and you don't know but he is struggling. And so that, that crossing the bridge to recognition and then having permission to say something, and sure enough, I've gotten text messages that he's talked to him and he's like, yeah, he's, he's, he's really struggling. Yeah. And he needed permission to go. I might have yelled at him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but sometimes that works. Nice. I might have yelled at him. We've been friends a long time. But, but even giving someone who is not his best friend, he's not his wife, He's just someone who cares about him, that permission to do it, and the tools to do it, and the recognition. Jesse, I haven't even been dying down there. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say that Lauren, she touched on it, but it's really important that we arm the people who are seeing the farmers in the crisis times. Veterinarians, the banker, mm -hmm. their doctor mm -hmm. when they go in because they have chest pain and they think they're having a heart attack, but really it's stress, you know arm them to understand agriculture and understand what to do in those times. Non-traditional. Yes. Very much. Because you've got to connect with somebody when you have it. And being able to get on a telehealth appointment, somebody and being able to be on there right away, if you have somebody who's able to take an appointment right away, that would be huge to be able to say, okay, let's see if we can get somebody on there right now. Because I don't know I would say developing a relationship ongoing isn't important <coughs> with that first time. You need to just have somebody in that moment when they are open to talk. Because in the next two hours, they will not be yep. open. Right. It's over. Yep. 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 They're done. They're yep. okay. Everything's fine. Yep. Moving on. I had my moment. And I'm good now. I have work so to do. Just, I'm going to move on. I'm going to have my, you know, it's going to work for just, you know, until, until the next time you break down. And back onto the broadband thing, um, my mom is from the Manhattan area, and where she grew up is five miles outside of Manhattan, and there's not a phone signal to call on your cell phone, and there's not internet. And the line goes right by. Same thing in our area, they were running fiber optic right close to the farm, and so we paid to have it come to our farm because it was kind of close. But my brother and sister-in-law have no cell phone signal, and no internet options. So if you're going to do rural communities, you're yeah. not going to have, yeah. you know, here, come so, remotely. It's like, yes. well. But, but I, a few miles away, can have every single device in my house 
streaming everything I want to, and just a few miles away, they can't even get internet unless it's dial-up. And it's the con it's the consistency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and where I grew up, um, they had the local provider wasn't allowed to get into the town, so they had to get a the company from that actually has interest in the area. They had to go get a grant from the government somehow. They had some sort of grant in order to buy out to take over so they could cover the town. So it's just, that's that's a huge, huge deal. Huge barrier. So I think that was, did you have something? I think the, another thing, you, we've talked a lot about making sure our bankers are, you know, the people that are with your farmers that they know, um, but we can't forget our young people. So I've got 27 kids in my 4-H club. Every single one, most of them are under the age of 10. Every single one of them is CPR certified. And once we get it figured out um, here in the next year, they will all have the mental health first aid um, as well. Okay, so it's just one of those things. I mean, and that's a lot to throw. I mean, when I'm talking about, you know, I got, I got 20 first graders that I got to figure out how to do this. Um, we're figuring out something, but it's an important piece. I'm gonna sneak in. First off, that is awesome. And secondly, you know, we talk about that younger generation and the gentleman I just talked about is under 30. And I see a tremendous amount of substance abuse in people under 30. Like it is almost, it's not a joke, but it's a running statement like, oh, yep, there he goes again. Used to be the high school star and now he drinks all day. And it's, it's, it's alarming how often that conversation is had. And those are supposed to be our succeeders of these operations. And again, that conversation hasn't been had. They're not empowered to think that way. They don't have the resources. And their generation that they look up to isn't always helping. <laughs> and I'll add on to that. Because, yeah, I've had my team members go, go through various of those struggles. I've shown up when I, when I get, get done from building a house and they're there just sitting in a fetal position like, <coughs> I don't know what I did wrong, but this sprinkler isn't working. I don't know what I did wrong, but this is over here. And I see alcohol, I see all the substance around there. And it's just like sometimes the hardest thing that I feel that needs to be said is breathe and take a step back. And you know, especially to a younger generation, especially to somebody my age, because I think I have the whole world ahead of me and I'm not afraid of everything, anything. But if somebody tells me, you know, breathe and step back and relax, I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> no, I ain't got time for that. But you have to. And that's a big, huge thing that I've had to do for my group of uh, my team. As in the last couple of years, I've had to tell them, hey, step back. Hey, breathe. Hey, I don't think this is the right place for you at the moment. So I need you to step away. And I've, I've had to tell really, really talented people, very smart, very hardworking guys. I can't have you on my farm anymore. This is doing more damage to you than it is doing good. So I need you to go elsewhere. And it's nothing personal. I love you and I care about you, but this isn't for you. And that's very important to tell somebody, especially my age, because there's a lot more opportunity. We have a lot more to live and experience. But if nobody tells us, then we're gonna think this is perfectly normal. And we're gonna think this is how we should be every day because that's how I was raised in my generation, in my family. I was raised work from dusk till dawn, work until you can't work anymore, take five seconds and then work some more. But, and I finally had to learn, you know, let's, let's rest where we can, let's take break, breaks what we can, and you know, really look at that mental health, physical health, and realize that you might be young, but you can do more damage if you're not careful. And just one more pl policy plug for everyone here. Uh, my first uh, 20 years of, of clinical practice was in cardiology. I'm an interventional cardiologist, did heart attack, strokes, pacemakers, loved it. And so when I transitioned to the primary care aspects, I realized we did all these staying alive, everybody knows how to do CPR, as all these folks have mentioned. But here, we do not know how to prevent and talk about something so basic as are you going to hurt yourself? And so we're very willing to talk about you know, CPR, 
we need the equivalent in the behavioral health standards to talk about, and we need that at the school level, at the hospital <coughs> levels, etc. So that needs to be just a basic part of what we do from a preventative health standpoint. I want to put in a plug for mental health first aid. Many of the things you've, we've been talking about are training folks in the community. We've trained over 2,000 individuals in uh, Northwest Kansas out of a population of 100,000 in mental health first aid to ask that question and be prepared to get someone to help. And I think mental health first aid, some of the other models, we have to train our communities in these models. If kids were going into schools, training them in, in mental health first aid. And I think that that is critical to get the person who's gonna be right next to you asking you that question at that critical time. That, that's one of the options. It's pretty intensive, but um, it uh, is a program across the country uh, forwarded by the uh, National Council of Mental Wellbeing so uh, I think also uh, I'm a strong believer in media driven, continuing in media to get our message out about the importance, the availability of 988, uh, the availability of mental health in integrated settings. You know, uh, and that's part of the reason we're doing this video taping, hopefully to develop some uh, PSAs um, to uh, uh, public service announcements, not the other kind of PSAs. So it, uh, we, uh, we have to get the message out. One of the, one of the sources of messaging that we have found very effective in the ag community is agriculture radio. We do a lot of advertising on various radio outlets uh, and radio is still a thing. Uh, out here it, 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 in the ag community, it is, but we have to learn how to change uh, with other uh, types of interventions. We're at the three o'clock hour. Uh, did you have? Yeah, I just think so. Uh, yeah, I just had kind of one thing I wanted to get out of maybe one or two folks, because you mentioned the video. <laughs> of course, this is public too, and we want people to see it. Um, and so you guys have shared all the great stuff you're doing, what the stressors are. Of course, it's given us a better perspective of where you're coming from. We've learned, you know, kind of also why maybe it's not being accessed as much, you know, because I can, you know, fix myself. Um, so, but I, I want to hear more from you guys about um, with what you're doing and the stuff you're working on and trying to implement and reach out and get better about mental health in the communities and accessing it and the reducing the stigma, which is, is good here to get better. But what I'd like to see maybe for the video and stuff is what, what resources, and specifically not always need more money, but more money for what? Like where could it, where can money come to? Is it programs for youth um, to implement it in youth programs, mental health services or messaging? You know, does anybody have any specific things where more money can be coming to? A certain program or something like that. Well, I have the microphone. So. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a Do you have a follow up question? Oh, yeah, I was done. That was it. Okay, okay. So, as I said in my introduction, I oversee programs for kids and families. So, one of the things that I can see is our work in the schools, and I think some of that has been said already. But our ability to integrate, you know, we talk about integrated care with, with medical practices, but also in schools. And if we have the ability to reach kids who are struggling, whether it's, you know, whatever the issue is, but especially related to agriculture, in a family that is under stress, where is the barometer of that? That's going to be little Johnny who's acting out in the school. Um, and so if we can make it easy, a seamless, Again, we've used telehealth for this purpose, but if we can, you know, that child can be referred and be in services without having to physically come into our building, I think that's another place where we really, and we've had liaisons with schools. So to me, from my perspective, that's one place to start. I just have one quick thing. I think 
programs that would help spouses, wives, whoever, and the kids, that maybe grown kids that see their parents struggling. I think programs to help teach those people because they're the ones that see them every day and they may not be able to influence your, you may not be able to influence your husband to go get help, but opening those doors and knowing how to do that without causing more issues and just knowing that balance I think is huge because that's how you can get that started, that little seed to where someone else may be able to get in through. I, I just want to say real quick, community gardens is all I say. I feel like community gardens in rural areas would allow families to be able to go there, families that aren't farmers, that aren't familiar with it, to go there and just have another outlet. My two cents. And likewise, again, equivalent to the CPR events, have the QPR events. We've done that very successfully in every high school, have it part of every health class, for example, churches. Rural people go to church much more than city folks, right? And so with that, have that be part of church programs. Um, and just bring it into the communities to talk about on a regular basis to reduce that stigma and make sure that it's something that can be open conversation for everyone. So destigmatize and have it available at the places that these folks will go. <laughs> I'll say that um, more grants we with our qpr program that we have um that were all, the several of us that have been trained it came through a grant to be able to pay to be able to be qpr trained i think we have 30 agents across the state and we use the grants now to train more people and then also for mileage to get to places we don't charge for our services so i've got myself and two other agents that are going to go down to a county and we are training every teacher in that school district on QPR. Um, to be able to do that more and more, you talked about bankers, we have done, and it was actually online because it was still at the edge of COVID, um, but an online QPR training for bankers. Um, but to get the word out, on the other hand, to get the bankers to show up to the one hour training. Um, I don't know if that can, you know, work into policy or something like that to be able to, you know, okay, to get this grant or to get this funding, you have to also have a mental health aspect. Um, I'm of course not a legislator, so I don't know how difficult that would be. Um, also, I think everybody's mentioned up here, breaking down the barriers for um, broadband and for fiber and to allow everybody to have it rather than no this is my property and you can't touch it that is a huge thing anywhere in rural um, areas and so just m more money to be put towards a nationwide um, uh, fiber system or broadband system that people cannot you know claim on this side of the road but not on this side of the road Ditto to what they, <laughs> you know, to everything they said. Uh, you know, whether it's broadband, because that's obviously a, that? a space that we we do support a, a lot and do a lot of work in. But I do want to say kudos um, in terms of some of the COVID dollars that went to schools. And for a lot of our schools, and they made it very public, it meant that they hired somebody who was. I mean, and we one of from our school, we did seal. Um, one of your high plains um, people um, so but Reagan does a great job and and she's in our school and we, we were able to create a position in our school for the first time our kids have a counselor in the school that used to be something that was standard it went away um, so COVID dollars have helped to bring that back um, the problem is going to be how do we continue funding that I think that's I think her position's funded for three years and then we're going to have to figure out how we continue doing that. I will tell you, I mean, she works K-12 for us. My kids have seen the benefit um, that that has been in there. So I just, I'm very grateful that we have been able to implement that in our school because of those dollars. And I really hope that we can continue to do that as well. Yeah, and I agree with everything that's been said before on this. And I think for mental health first aid training, QPR is wonderful resources uh, and give great information I myself I'm a mental first health, mental first aid uh, health trainer, uh, so I think there's some great information there. I think also the real benefit is uh, in the conferences I've been in. I've been kind of 
I guess snuck in is maybe the <laughs> yes, best way to put it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. I mean, you don't have to be quiet about it. We have snuck him yeah, in, okay? <laughs> and it's very nice to be able to be at conferences where it's not the majority is mental health focused. Uh, yet here this hour is, this guy's going to talk about stress and resilience. And people kind of come in because I think they're just kind of curious. And it's amazing the engagement I get from those crowds when the fact of the matter is the next they're talking about hay buying and, and apps to use for that. And I mean, after that, there's these other pieces and it's just kind of sneaking this in and embedding this. Also, I know it's really early on uh, and the Rural Resilience Coalition is just kind of talking about these pieces, but we really are trying to think about how to get just some information about mental health that's palatable to people into the sale barns, into the co-ops, uh, and just being able to have it be there, but not have it be in anybody's space and just being able to have that kind of uh, around at that time. Well, so. In her office. In my office. Yeah. Yes. So I write quarterly newsletters. Mm -hmm. I write quarterly newsletters to my clients about cows. Let's be honest, it's about cows. <laughs> but, because <laughs> that's, and I can get some of them to read them actually. It's taken some effort. But what I was commenting, I was writing notes early on. Brochures are wonderful and they look really great. Trying to get people to read them is a challenge. Um, and my generation hates to read them. I don't even like to pick up the phone. I like the text. And so I still do some old radio ads, but those newsletters that are cow focused, people who are writing those, your beef magazine, your, your regular things, getting them to say something. Mm -hmm. And it might be 200 words on the side of a column, but oh hey, Doc wants to talk about that too. And if you can make that normal, but you're gonna have to get the people who already reach them to look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 He's like, we don't want to deny you the opportunity. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, that came up. Uh, can I have a mic? Uh, we... It's coming. <laughs> this is. Oh, yeah. I thought these people were going to be like quiet and just sit there and couldn't get it started. You know, like pulling the rope to get it started. That would... <laughs> Someone today at Dylan's farm, one of his partners, uh, 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 neighbors, mentioned the uh, reading the, uh, I don't know if it was the, can, a journal that came in the mail. That uh, That's where he picked up a lot of his information, those little snippets. He talked about self-care, self-coaching, and he picked up those advice. I think sometimes we need not, we shouldn't assume that us city folk and how we pick up pamphlets and all mesh with how folks on the farm deal with life and all that sometimes, I don't know, I used to get those at home, but all the, the farm publications, I assume people are still getting and rely on as very important in getting these, the, the messages out. Pardon? The front of the phone book. The front of the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, one thing we've started doing is even uh, uh, at various pharmacies, uh, putting our name on the, the bags, uh, give the pharmacy bags. It's that steady drip of making it so common and that mental health is just as common as physical health, and it's okay to talk about it. Uh, I want to put in a plug for workforce and funding for workforce for people to return to rural areas is critical. There is funding there sometimes, the hoops and loops to access that. Why are you laughing, Ken? Because I talked to you because about hoops and loops. Yes, and, and help. Um, I wound up coming here in 1976 from Colorado because of a National Institute of Mental Health grant that sent me to graduate school. It's the only reason I'm sitting here today. And I think if we can incentivize uh, some of the education of individuals from physicians to counselors to stay in our rural areas, <clears throat> that's so important. It's pretty complex. If there are other in ways to incentivize workforce for mental health, uh, I would encourage that. I just want to send a message to the secretary that I, we really appreciate his inquiry into this 
area. I mean, it's very meaningful. I can't tell you how meaningful it is that uh, the secretary thought of the importance of this. You all thought about that. Uh, it's the first time in my recollection that uh, anyone at HHS has really reached out to ask about this specific issue. So if you wouldn't mind conveying uh, to him our, all of our appreciation for doing this, and he's always welcome to come to Hayes. So, well, I, I just uh, want to say thank you for inviting us. Uh, thank all the panelists. Thank the farmers that invited us out on the farm, the legislators that came down, husband, wives, everyone, and I definitely want to thank the RAs here, our staff, FDA, uh, for uh, coming to here. And I can promise you that. I will be conveying this. I definitely hear about non-traditional. And I'm thinking now about uh, when we talk to the chambers of commerce uh, in rural areas and the act, they say, what can we do? A lot of them are asking, what can we do? So this is really giving a lot of great information here. So I just want to thank you. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. <laughs> so just a reminder, Kim with SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services. This is a what we call a challenge coin. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but um, I'm, this is for you, Walt, because uh, on this issue of ag and mental health, you lead in, in Kansas, you know? And uh, it is appreciated, it's noticed, uh, it's appreciated. Um, High Plains is, you know, a high quality place you know, that people in the area turn to, come to. When we knew this was going to be, you know, a topic, you are the only person we thought of to, and, and you are the reason that we're all here. Okay. So, you know, grateful for what you do for this community and for people with serious mental illness. And just appreciate that. No, I didn't grow up on a farm. My parents had farm interest. I still have a picture of my grandparents and stories of my great-grandparents who homesteaded in Dickinson County. Uh, great-grandparents who came over, homesteaded, lived in a rock cabin on a property line so that the two of them could get their, their property uh, nailed down. It is part of, so, several people have said it's in our DNA. And um, I think you know, we struggle hard, whoever we are that have an ag connection, to keep hold of that. We see it kind of shriveling away, but we're also fighters and uh, we stand up and that's why I love this part. And that's why I do this, is I care so much about all of the folks in the ag community and our rural frontier communities. Uh, we need to stand up for one another. So thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. I would, uh, unless there are burning questions from the, the tour, the tour or the panel, I want to thank our panel. This is just wonderful. <laughs> Sign me up for another year. They'll be here two more weeks. It's, it's just, it's impressive the resource of what you learn when you talk to people that are boots on the ground. I think that that's the, one of the messages I had across the board here. I appreciate your coming. So if there are no other questions, I know at the end we did have the opportunity for any media. Uh, connections. We appreciate uh, Hayes Post being here. If you in the audience, if people in the audience have specific questions or thoughts for you on the panel or you on the tour group, uh, we, we've asked, we haven't talked much with the audience yet, but could they just come up as we kind of disperse and talk with you all and give you thoughts or questions? Our guests from uh, KDADS and from uh, the uh, Kansas Department of Agriculture. Are you all willing to stay around for a few minutes and talk with folks from the uh, community? We got more to <laughs> Hey, you are in the middle, you are in the middle of nowhere. And you know, there actually is 
Yes. There actually are places that are the middle of nowhere, and Oakley, Kansas is one of those. Because it's like three and a half, three and a half hours to a population center of more than 60,000 or something. And I love it being in the middle of nowhere. It's the best place to be. So with that, we uh, can, uh, we will adjourn the formal part of the group. Thank you for everyone who came. Please take time to uh, to uh, interact with our guests. Drive safe. Break the rings.